and welcome to Captains of Industry with me, Kopano Gumbi. Today, we're talking to an IT conglomerate chief executive, Mr. Grant Bodley, who's been with the company for roughly 20, 21 years. Grant, thank you so much for joining us this Pleasure, thank you for afternoon. 21 years at the business. Mm, when you first started, did you think that you would last this long? Oh, look, I didn't think I'd be in Johannesburg, let alone in IT when I first started, um, you know. Having studied agriculture and grown up on a farm, it was quite a shift in direction. But, you know, 21 years later, I've got no regrets, made wonderful friends, and it's been an incredible journey. What drew you here in the first place? As you say, you grew up on a farm, you had a clear path to agriculture. It, it was interesting. I had a chance meeting uh, uh, when I was working as a game ranger at Londolozi. I met Jeremy Ward and Doc Watson, who were the founders. And uh, they encouraged me to come join, which I clearly said there was no way it was happening uh, because I knew nothing about IT. I started one of my own little businesses and bottling seawater and selling it. And that became challenging when I needed a bottling plant. Couldn't find the funding and all of those types of things. But I'd kept in regular contact with Jeremy and he kept encouraging me to come join Dimension Data. So, you know, it, whatever I was, 21, 22, however long ago that was, maybe a bit older because I'm as you know, what, what am I, 44 now? Um, yeah, I joined, so uh, with no real expectations at the time. No expectations, but clearly they saw something in you. Well, I think uh, if you ask them or no, I mean, I'm clearly not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I think I had a way of engaging with people. I mean, I've always been incredibly passionate about people and relationships, super competitive, and always wanted to achieve whatever it was. So, you know, came in as a young sales guy and managed to to, to do okay, um, and yeah, from there it's been, a, as I said, I've been very fortunate and blessed to be given great opportunities and learned a hell of a lot along the way. You have been in many different parts of this business. When you started out as a sales team, sales member, and then you moved on and you grew through the ranks into executive positions, what do you think it is about the culture of Dimension Data that has kept you here so long? Look, it's, it's an interesting topic and, and we're just revisiting certain aspects of our business now. But you speak to anyone here, you ask why they work at Dimension Data, and they'll generally always say it's the people. I often joke when I talk at the induction when people come here, I say some of the hardest, or in fact the hardest decision I ever had to make at Dimension Data was who not to invite to my wedding. You know, and I don't think there are many corporates or organisations where that's the case. You know, um, my wife often jokes it was almost like a work function. But, but that is the beauty. I think like-minded people come here. I've always said that we're not necessarily a technology company, but we're a people company. And uh, when you've got an organisation that treasures people's well-being and tries to create a fertile environment, you know, it, it makes for a great workplace. And, and as I said, I'm very fortunate to have many, many close friends who I've developed over the years. Yeah. You've also had to develop a culture, surround yourself with a certain kind of team in order for you guys to grow from strength to strength. How did you decide on your work style Look, I'm not sure I decided on it. I mean, I obviously joined IATA in you know, 1999, I think it was, and, and, and there was already a culture. But if you listen to, to people who've been around a long time, you listen to people like Jeremy and Doc talk, I mean, I think it was in the early days, certainly, they, they played a lot of sport. It was a work hard, play hard type environment. They employed people that were friends and like-minded. You know, and they were always super competitive. They want to be the best. Quality was everything and making sure that they achieved it. So by default that came, but then they also celebrated. You know, when, when success was there, it's important to celebrate these successes. You know, we live in such pressurized environments and lives now that, you know, I think when, when good things do come about, it's important that you, you do celebrate those things. So I was fortunate to come into a, an established organization that had a really, really healthy um, culture. And hopefully, you know, in my time, or certainly a culture that I embraced and thoroughly enjoyed, and hopefully in my current role, you know, I still respect that culture, hopefully try and maintain and encourage that culture. Of course, there's shifts and moves and nuances, you know, there's a macro culture with any micro organism or part of the business, there's subcultures. But, but at, at, the, at the macro level, you know, the values are still very important to us. You know, teamwork's a huge part of our world, you know, respect and diversity and all of these things. So. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that we hold sacred because, you know, people are our differentiator and uh, we need to make sure that they feel at home and comfortable and can be true to themselves and authentic. You know, authenticity for me is, is, is a really, really key attribute that's required. You've, you've often been quoted as somebody who, who stands by diversity. You are, you're a key believer in diversity. Is that because growing up in Matai all you spoke is Tosa? 
Look, uh, I mean, I've had a diverse upbringing, you know, from growing up in, as I said, on a farm, Closer was my first language, school in Natal, work in the bush, traveling. So, so for me, you know, diversity is, is really, really important, you know, in any aspect. I've also been very fortunate in all the teams that I've managed to have diversity of age, gender, skill, race, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not always easy, but what it does do is bring um, different thought processes, different sort of opinions, and with that, you know, you, you, you get a better outcome. So for me, diversity is an incredibly important aspect of, of anything in life, right? Be it a team or be it a corporate or whatever. So certainly something I'm passionate about, um, but at the same time, as I said, it's not something that is always easy. And I think particularly in our country where you've got such diversity of whatever, 11 different languages, different cultures, and I think as South Africans, we're learning, you know, if you don't grow up spending time with people from different cultures, how do you know how to react and inter integrate with people, respect the different behaviours and cultures? And if I look at our geographies, you know, when I go to Saudi Arabia, for example, the culture there versus Kenya versus here is very different. So, you know, I think it's a journey for all of us. And I think any human being needs to spend more time trying to understand, first and foremost, themselves. And then secondly, the people that they engage with, because through that, I think you gain a healthier respect and understanding and probably get better outcomes in a better working environment. And as you embrace all of these diversities mm. and change and over the years as the business has grown and, and developed, you went through an interesting time as well, right? Uh, Dimension Data was bought up by mm. NTT, you were delisted and then split up again to become Dimension Data MEA, which yeah. is what you head now. What have you noticed? What was some of the hardest change through that period? Look, I think you hear all these fancy quotes, you know, that if the rate of change outside your organization is greater than the change inside your organization, you're headed for, for some challenges. So I think the first thing is to get people to accept that change is reality. But change is hard, you know? Not everyone is able to adjust and change. So, you know, the first thing with NTT when they first acquired us in 2011, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you know, um, hats off to them is they totally respected the dimension data culture and the fact that there were humans and if you had to fundamentally mess with that culture, you would lose all of that. Um, so I think, you know, the Japanese culture then on the other hand is fundamentally different and we've had to learn to understand and respect each other. But I think, you know, they're an incredibly respectful nation. Um, so, you know, there's been all sorts of challenges, the ways of working, total independence to now different ways of reporting, different strategies. So, you know, I just think people need to be adaptable. If you cannot adapt, you know, adapt or die and all of these types of things. Um, so, you know, the latest changes and all of these things, I mean, are they all exciting, right? And I think they're all done for good reason um, to, to obviously make sure that we have a sustainable business, a business that remains relevant, that can help transform, you know, country and industry or whatever the case may be. So, you know, the changes have all happened, uh, you know, and will continue to happen. And, and as I said, you know, some people will have the ability to move that change, others don't. Some people get change fatigue, but it's just the reality. And we, we, we wake up the next day, we move on to the next thing. As long as there's, you know, a, a Northern Star or, a, you know, an end goal that you're working towards and you can explain the change. I find that's the biggest reason for failure in most of these things. Explain the why, you know, why are we making these changes? What's the rationale? A and also explain it so it filters through the whole organization. Quite often the executive team may be aware of it because they're part of all the decision making and the strategy, but every single person in the organization needs to understand why it makes sense to them, whether you're in marketing, whether you're a receptionist, whether you're in finance, whether you're an engineer, you know, what role can I play to enable that change to become a reality to fulfill on the end goal or strategy or outcome? So communication and the change management around the change is, is often a thing that I certainly see uh, where people underinvest um, and, and, you know, sometimes fail with the actual execution of it. Grant, when you were then appointed CEO mm. of Dimension Data, you were given a very clear mandate that the company needed to restructure, reorganize, re-energize and double its revenue. Did you do it? We certainly had a good first few years, uh, let me tell you. Um, and, and look, restructuring is always very, very difficult. And I think in the first few years, it's easy to get some quick wins. 
I think the last two or three years, as much as we've continued to grow, the rate of growth, I think the, the economy hasn't helped the change in those types of things. But, you know, if I look back over the last, you know, I think it's almost my fifth year in the role now, I'm not sure. Um, you know, by and large, I, th I think we've achieved quite a lot of the mandates that we've done. Still a long way to go. Um, you know, the world we operate in, the industry we operate in is so fast paced. Um, and, you know, quite a lot of transformation has happened and a whole lot more needs to happen, you know, as we continue to evolve and ensure that we're relevant in every geography that we operate in um, and, and make sure that we're relevant in terms of what our clients need and what the market dictates. Do you think that in South Africa with this new drive of 4IR and, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, do you think that South Africa has missed the wave or caught up? I think too many South Africans just use this 4IR quite glibly. Um, I'm not sure everyone understands it. The reality is I think there are absolute pockets of excellence where the industries and organizations and corporates have leveraged technology or 4IR to be able to fundamentally transform the way they do it. Um, I think there are a couple of dependencies on it, I think quite topical in the press right now, is spectrum. You know, do we have enough spectrum available to promote you know, acceleration of certain types of initiatives and activities related to 4IR. Um, but, you know, I often think that, you know, I travel the world quite a lot. We're a global organization and, and there are certain parts of, of, of our industry and our businesses where we're as good as anyone in the world and the other parts where we're behind. So I do think, however, if we do embrace it all, we do have an opportunity to, to really accelerate certain aspects. I do think it can make a big difference to the economy. I think it can make a big difference more to society for me. I think technology has a huge uh, way of maybe helping underprivileged people, reaping, reaching people in rural areas, just be it education, be it telemedicine for healthcare, be it, you know, scarcity in, in South Africa and Africa is food and water. You know, how do we leverage technology to manage those scarce resources better? So. I think there's a huge opportunity for it, no doubt. Um, there are a couple of key things that would accelerate it. But, like what? But, well, I think the spectrum is the number one thing. I mean, I think that is, 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 is really it. And then skills development. I mean, I think we need to breed a fertile soils where people can have the necessary development and skills to be able to code better or, you know, create the minds that, that have, you know, the IP to be able to become entrepreneurs and solve some of these challenges through technology. You know, I think we've got skill shortages across the globe, but certainly in South Africa in certain areas, there's some skill shortages. Some of our top skills, we're having brain drains, you know, um, and those types of things. Us being a global organization, a lot of our top skills want access and exposure to working in, I don't know, America, Europe, Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to make sure that we are retaining the, and developing the best skills to be able to help us transform uh, our, our, our country and our society and our, and our industries. And how does Dimension Data take a, a leadership role in, in that respect? Look, I think, as I said, because people are such a big part of our business, a huge amount of our effort is on training and development. We've got graduate programs, we've got internship programs, we've got leadership development programs. So, I mean, we spend, you know, in excess you know, of 100 million a year just in South Africa, just on training and development, that's in cash and those types of things, let alone non-cash type of spend. So. Um, we do take on a lot of learners, a lot of internships, you know, two, three hundred a year in different pockets and different access, uh, you know, aspects of our business. So I think that is, is one thing. We've obviously got the Saturday School, which is something we're really, really, really proud of, where it's grade nine or grade 10 and 11 learners, I call standard nine, standard 10, what's it, 11 and 12 learners now we bring in and have been doing for the last 25, 30 years, 100% pass rate, helping them with things like math, science, now coding, life skills, a lot of those things, those graduates or students getting funding from us uh, to go to university, coming back as graduate program, you know, a lot of our staff take those lessons. So from all the schools around surrounding the campus, we're opening up a, an initiative now in the Eastern Cape. So I think we do do as much as we can, you know, a, a significant amount. I'm certainly proud of what we've done. I think we've done a poor job, as Dimension Data, in really telling our story in terms of what amazing things we've done to, to make a difference to children's lives, particularly from an education point of view, skills development point of view. So we could always do more and we'll continue to do more, um, but, but that is a key role. I mean, I think 
Also, you know, we're part of various forums working with government and the like to say, okay, guys, what are the critical skills? You know, when you mix it and these types of things, what skills should we be developing? You know, security skills, coding skills, what are those skills? Um, so I do think we have a role to play with government to ensure that, you know, we can share some of our learnings and knowledge of this space to make sure that we are thought leaders in terms of where we invest and how we invest to build capable you know, workforce and, and, and give these children an opportunity. Absolutely. I, you know, I think in any given year, there are 100,000 odd students that are graduating from universities with degrees in IT or, mm. or code, not necessarily coding, but in, in all these IT related yeah. fields. Um, software engineers, Absolutely. developers, etc. But then they still sit at home for about a year, a year oh and look, a half. I, I How are we not creating an opportunity to absorb them? That's the sad reality and I think, you know, I think look, there are a couple of initiatives. And if you look at BLSA and sort of, you know, the President, the Yes Initiative, Youth Employment Scheme, I mean, I think those types of things. I think if I look at some of, let's take the BE Charter, for, for example, certainly in our aspect, the aspects of it that are, I absolutely understand and get, but the aspects that of it that are maybe counter to job creation. And, and I think all policy needs to be focused on job creation. Uh, I think at the forefront that is our biggest challenge, right, is this very large unemployed base. And so how do we as corporates and how does government work with corporates to make it easier and more affordable for us? Because I think having someone in the office learning a skill rather than sitting at home is way better, you know, whatever the salary may or may not be. So I think there's a lot of effort going into this between government and corporates to, to try and get this right. But I, I still think there's room for improvement in that space, you know. Us as corporates do what we can. At the same time though, we also have shareholders. We have to have sustainable businesses. So there's a degree of affordability um, that, you know, one needs to manage. So, you know, how long is that piece of string and all of these types of things. But, you know, I think the right conversations are happening. Are they happening fast enough? Are people brave enough to make the right calls to change some of what hasn't worked, you know? Um, there's certain policies that you know maybe haven't worked. They had great intentions, and maybe we need to rethink some of those. So that comes down to dialogue, you know. Um, but you know, there's no shortage of effort. I think if you read any newspaper or any press, I mean that that seems to be the topical thing. Um, but are the right conversations, the right people happening? Let's see. In your line of work, are the right conversations happening around regulation in the IT space? Because I could imagine there. There's some things coming down the line, the pipeline in terms of data security and, and consumer uh, protection that we haven't really thought through. Look, uh, that space is a maturing space, you know, particularly when it comes to security, to data protection, these things. And you've got acts like Poppy and GDPR and these types of things which are trying to address that. But it's a maturing world. You know, other aspects of regulation, I think some of them are, I think the conversations are happening, it's just whether the decisions are making and whether the policies are being acted fast enough. Um, the conversations are certainly happening. I'm just not sure that the execution and the scripting and putting these policies into practice is happening as fast as, as we would all like. I mean, obviously it's a complex world and there are lots of things to take into consideration. But, but we need this, you know, there's an aspect of governance that's required and there's an aspect of, you know, stimulating the economy through you know, opening up certain policies that will encourage people to invest and take a chance and, and, and those types of things. So yeah, I would argue we could be better at it. How does that play into your global businesses? Because you, I know South Africa is your head office, but you have operations in Dubai, in Japan, in other parts of the Middle East as well, and other parts of Africa. So how do you manage all of these different moving parts, everybody's speed being different? It very, it's very complicated in many ways, but others not so much. I mean, we obviously have got a macro strategy in terms of what we're trying to achieve and what our go-to-market is. And then they're obviously in-country nuances. So we've got country managers in each country. You know, if you go to Saudi now, there's Saudiization. What do you do? How do you address? What are, the, you know, what are your policies around, you know, those types of things? And then, of course, there's certain solutions which are easier to take to market. Just so you can have a vanilla sort of white label solution, and then you've got to customize it to a degree to be able to make do with the regulations in a particular geography or country, what the market opportunity is. So, so you know, a degree of um, 
should we call it customization or localization, that's a better word, to, to what the particular geography in, is there. You know, it's not that every solution is relevant to, to every single geography, but 80 to 90% of them can scale and can be taken to most geographies. And just one or two nuances where you've got to take into cognizance. And you rely then on the local, local teams to help guide you through that. What attracted you to the Middle East? And Dubai especially, what attracted you to Look, I mean, I think if, if you go there, and I was there a week ago, I mean, it, it's just such a fast developing world, uh, part of the world. I think if you look at where Dubai's located in terms of being sort of between Africa, Europe and Asia, it's pretty central. A lot of your large global players are there. So you, you, you have to have some kind of, if you want to be relevant and play on a global scale and support global customers, be it global banks, global whoever it is, it's a massive opportunity. If you look at Saudi now, the investment they're having, you know, building, for example, these new cities, Neom, I think it's something like a $500 billion investment just in a brand new digital city. So, you know, uh, Dubai is more about being relevant to our global clients and being able to service them in that market. Saudi's, although it's got a whole lot of nuances and quite a challenging environment to work in if you don't understand it, but it's opening up so fast. And if you can crack it, it really is an exciting place to be. Um, you know, I've been going there, I think the first time I went there was 2007. From then to today, you can't recognize the transformation in terms of culture, policy, you know, just everything is, 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 is amazing at how with just a change in leadership and a change in mindset, how the prince has just encouraged a whole lot of transformation of, of the country itself. So. You know, that, that we saw opportunity on one hand and, and necessity on another. And the offering that you provide there, is it different to what you have to provide in South No, America? I mean, it's very much the same solutions here. I mean, of course, because we're not as at scale in some of these geographies, there's some solutions that we won't take there just because of, you know, our ability to compete maybe, access to skills, etc. But, you know, everything that we offer here is relevant there. The point of the matter is, is just we haven't chosen, you know, the cost of entering some of these countries, you can go in there and try and offer the world. It's rather win in certain focus areas, get those to scale, and then you can broaden your, your, your offering to the market. But uh, our entire offering is relevant to those markets. It's just how quickly you can get the entire offering or all of those offerings to scale. And what is the next phase of your strategic execution? You speak often about the dimension data strategy. So, so look, I mean, I think, you know, November was quite a big milestone for us, announcing obviously the BE transaction. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we referenced the fact that dimension data globally has been rebanded NTT, whereas here in South Africa and the Middle East, we're remaining dimension data. Um, <coughs> quite a lot of discussions now around the shareholding, you know, with the BE transaction and those types of things. So, uh, you know, the, there's some, the, next, the next 12 to 18 months, there's some really, really exciting things that I think will, will unfold. You know, not all of them I can share or talk about now, but I'd argue, argue that it's probably going to be the most exciting, certainly 18 to 24 months uh, in my time at Dimension Data for this local geography as we, you know, continue the evolution of our journey and continue to to evolve and make sure that we remain relevant, particularly this. You know, we're proudly South African, proudly African uh, a company. And, you know, I think a lot of our focus was on globalization and we almost got quiet here in many ways as we established a brand in the Americas or Europe or Asia. And, and I think we have a significant opportunity to, to reinvigorate our brand. I mean, we're certainly relevant here now with our you know, the BE transaction and those types of things. We've been sustainable. I mean, we've been around for 35, 36 years. Um, you know, our, our integrity and ethics and those types of things that are something that's very sacred and we see as a differentiator for us now. But, you know, when I talk to my team, you know, I think if you start dreaming, getting bold about what we can do, you know, I, I, I say to the guys, you know, I, I think, you know, if I could imagine one thing is how does dimension data as people and technology unlock the potential of Africa? You know, imagine that. I, that's when I talk about, you know, education, healthcare, agriculture, I think we have that opportunity. We've certainly got the skills, I think we have an established brand, but we've been quiet and we need to share with the world and certainly with South Africa and Africa and the Middle East what it is we're doing, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm incredibly excited and, and I think over the next six months or so, we'll start sharing a lot of those developments with the market and, and with our clients. We've got a new go-to-market which we're really, really excited about. Uh, we've started sharing that. So, so yeah, exciting times ahead.
lots of growth in the, in the future? We hope. Uh, you know, we all aspire for growth. Um, I think in the local market, you know, the growth opportunities are maybe gaining market share in many areas. Um, I think public sector is an area that hasn't spent and it's an area we haven't necessarily penetrated, but I do think we're now relevant to them and we've got opportunity there. And then obviously parts of Africa and the Middle East, there certainly is uh, a lot of uh, opportunity for growth. Much higher GDP, ICT less pervasive, so more infrastructure investment and in these types of things as we get more scale, you know, in some of those geographies. So, so optimistic about growth north of our borders. In, in, in the local market, absolutely see growth, but I think it's going to be more challenging in that that growth is through gaining market share from you know, say competitors and those types of things. I do think there's opportunity for acquisition, which will fuel growth and support just the organic growth uh, and making sure that we, we scale out some of our new exciting go to markets and make sure that they're relevant for, for all clients that we deal with. Grant, that's all we have time for today. Thank you for Thank you. speaking yeah, to us. That's it from me, Kopano Gumbi. Thanks for watching.